Hello, and welcome to the live Q&A talkback following the screening of The Five Powers Revolution, the powerful film that you've just seen. It's my great pleasure today to introduce an esteemed panel who have been involved with the film in a number of capacities and will share their experiences and perspectives on the film, its importance in today's global marketplace, and how it can be used as a guide for the practices of nonviolence around the world as we navigate some of the unique challenges that we are all undertaking. My name is Noam Dromi. I'm one of the executive producers of the film, and I will introduce our panel and invite each of them on um, to introduce themselves as well. So first up, it's my pleasure to, to introduce <clears throat> amongst this esteemed panel, um, it, representing the monastic community of Plum Village, uh, Brother F <clears throat> Brother Tai Fap Young, uh, who will be joining the conversation today. Uh, next up, it is my pleasure to introduce Laura Hassler, who is the founder and director of Musicians Without Borders and the daughter of Alfred Hassler, who is one of the uh, subjects of this film and a critical part of the story that it tells followed by Dr. Anthony Nicotera, who is the interim co-executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and one of the executive producers of the film. And lastly, Gregory Kennedy, the creator, co-director, and producer of the film. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you. Hello, thank you for being here. Uh, just make sure that all of you are off of um, mute, please, if you would be so kind. Thanks, Noam. Excellent. Thanks, um, Noam. Uh, thank you so much. Um, well, a lot of ground to cover today, um, and uh, I wanted to begin, um, Gregory, with you. Um, this is a, a formidable undertaking to put together a documentary that charts really not only an amazing historical uh, journey, but also a broader perspective on sort of the state of navigating times of uncertainty and the general practices of uh, nonviolence and the tenants therein. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how this story came to your awareness and what prompted you to create the film. Um, well, the short story is, is that um, I attended a class with this very <clears throat> passionate professor um, Anthony Nicotera, who introduced us to a book uh, called Pieces Away, Writings on Nonviolence, um, that was written by the Fellowship for Reconciliation. And within that book um, was the story, uh, were stories um, about um, uh, many well-known people um, in the nonviolent movement. Um, but then there was a story about a guy, Alfred Hassler, who, uh, and Thich Nhat Hanh and Martin Luther King Jr. that I had no idea about. So that's how it began. Years later, I started working with the fellowship, met the daughter of Alfred in the Netherlands. She uh, introduced me to the MLK comic book, a lot of pictures of Thich Nhat Hanh and Sister Chen Kong, Thai, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh when he had hair, <laughs> and um, all kinds of uh, other photos. And um, I joked with her, I think it was 2005, something like that, that I would love to make a movie about that about this story someday, um, not knowing how that was going to happen. That's the short story, so thank you. Excellent, uh, and, and Anthony, since you were obviously uh, a professor to Gregory and sort of a seminal part of introducing him to uh, this particular story, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your involvement with the project as well. Sure, thanks so much, Norman. Good to be with you all. Thank you for your interest in, in and support of the film. There's no greater satisfaction for a teacher or a professor than when the student becomes the teacher. And in fact, that uh, happened in this case where Greg, uh, a student in one of my first uh, nonviolent peacemaking and global social justice courses, uh, goes on to work with the International Fellowship of Reconciliation and then create direct produce this film and invited me in to help with uh, as an advisor at first and then to help produce the film uh it's been an honor and a privilege 
I also wanted to share that it is really a labor of love. Uh, and it has been uh, 12 years of many people. This film is the product of many people, a great team of people over the years working tirelessly. And Greg uh, working, I think, as tirelessly as any of them to, to produce the film and get it out into the world. I think it's a film that tells a story uh, across geographies, across faith traditions, uh, that is critically important in the fierce urgency of now, in this moment, and as the interim co-executive director of the Fellowship for Reconciliation with my colleague and friend, who many of you may know, Ethan Vesley Flad, I am hoping that this film helps continue the legacy of Alfred Hessler, the Fellowship for Reconciliation, our narrator, Reverend Dr. Emma Jordan Simpson, the most recent executive director of the Fellowship for Reconciliation, she invited us often to work to subvert the world order. And I hope that this film contributes to the subverting of the world order and the building of a more beloved, compassionate, just, and peaceful community. So thank you all for your support. Thank you, Anthony. Um, Laura, as the literal living embodiment of the legacy of Alfred Hassler, um, you had a front seat to some of um, what is recounted in the film, certainly, if not directly, then just by growing up in a household with a father who, you know, really endeavored to practice what he preached with regard to the practices of nonviolence. And I'd love for you just to get a little bit of perspective on your recollections of your father and um, what he would share with you about the experiences that are recounted with the creation of the uh, MLK and the Montgomery Story comic, and just in general, uh, the relationship with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and and the the practice of nonviolence and and endeavoring to make this world a healthier, more sane place. Thank you, Noam. I think I could probably talk for two hours to try to answer all of those questions, but a couple of highlights. Um, Yes, uh, I remember our father, uh, Alfred, he was, he was, I think, to all of us, me, my sister, and my brother, um, not just a father figure, but also a friend. He, he loved that kind of cross-generational contact. Um, I laughed uh, about the, I still laugh a little bit about the, the success of the Martin Luther King comic book, because in fact, we weren't allowed to have comic books as children because um, my, my dad didn't think that they were real literature, but he definitely did see their um, attraction because we would sneak off to neighbors and read comic books at the neighbor's house. Um, but yes, uh, we grew up in the whole atmosphere of um, activism, of building community. We also lived in a cooperative community, which my father had helped to found. And I grew up also, um, in some ways, as, as I guess I think of him as my mentor because, uh, because I also went into peace activism as a student and then worked for a couple of peace organizations uh, during the Vietnam War, um, doing civil disobedience against with a Quaker organization, then working for a medical committee that brought war-injured Vietnamese children to the U.S., for, um, for medical attention. And when I was doing that, Alfred asked me to go to Vietnam on behalf of himself and, and um, Thich Nhat Hanh and Sister Chan Kong, because they were working on a, um, on a campaign. It was called the Stop the Killing Campaign. And they thought that there would be some support from not only their colleagues in the Buddhist movement, in Vietnam, but also uh, within the South Vietnamese parliament at that point. And my father couldn't get in it anymore. He was blacklisted. And because I had this kind of medical uh, uh, help organization job, I had a kind of a cover. So I went and um, and spent five days only in, uh, in and around Saigon and met some of these amazing young activists and um, Buddhist um, uh, monks and nuns. And after that, uh, Thai asked me if I would come to Paris and work in their office. And I did that also for a year. So I spent a year working with them um, in 19, 
72 and 73. Um, so I was still in my 20s, very young. And then two more years uh, working actually from the Office of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, then in Nyack, New York, on their behalf. And at that point, it was, the war was still going on, but it was kind of groaning on. It, it was the, all of the hopes of a, of a, a settlement of what they were referring to as a third way had been kind of abandoned uh, or given up. There wasn't much choice anymore and much chance. And mostly what we were doing was basically trying to help the victims, trying to do whatever was possible to get Buddhist political prisoners, get attention for that, um, for activists who had been persecuted, raising money to help um, war injured people, um, trying to bring uh, Vietnamese orphans under the protection of their family members rather than having them adopted outside. So these were kind of small humanitarian things. And, uh, you know, I lived it with them in a period when when um, there wasn't a lot of hope and it was a very sad time. And I think at the same time, sort of learning this um, ability to be present in for that grief but also for the beauty of walking in, a, in, in the woods or growing herbs in a pot or cooking or drinking tea together. And to me, those were just a very um, fundamental life lessons. And I think in, just to bring it slightly to where we are now in the world, um, there, there has, uh, I don't, I've never known a time when there hasn't been war raging. And, and, and my work now with Musicians Without Borders brings us to many war areas, but finding that space where you can both breathe, be present, experience the joy that there is, and also be present for the grief and do what you can to transform, as, as um, Anthony said. So, Big lessons, and sorry, those are just little little scraps of things. But I think for me, no, that, very formative. That's that's lovely, and thank you for not only sharing that broader perspective, but personal context as well. And then, lastly, uh, and thank you for waiting so patiently, uh, Brother Young. Um, I wanted to get your perspective. You know, we we sit here today. Um, sharing this film with this audience that has been kind enough to join us and the broader audience that will be exposed to it roughly six months after Thich Nhat Hanh's transition. Um, and while certainly we mourn the loss of the human, I think that the broader lessons that he imparted, uh, you know, for decades and decades uh, remain as relevant and steadfast as ever. I'd love to get your perspective a little bit on why a film such as this um, is an important teaching tool uh, and, and how the monastic community and specifically the community at Plum Village um, looks to you know, the film and its use as a, as a media asset to spread the messages that are so central to the work that you do. And everyone, it's so wonderful to be with you and to continue our teacher's work, Alfred's work, as well as Martin Luther King, which is kind of like the seed of the comic book that inspired uh, this continuation. And I think this is a wonderful effort to, to educate in a media that's actually quite uh, accessible for uh, young people, especially, you know, and, and I'm connecting in from America. And as you know, it's uh, quite violent here. And just recently, the shooting in Tulsa. And it, so, you know, there's this, uh, it's not just about war, and military but it's about our attitude and to see that violence is a solution and violence is a way of expression so i think our culture in general especially in america that uh, it's okay you know we're here talking about like coming up with laws against guns but then we're shipping military equipment to you know to the ukraine you know so what what is <laughs> so i think I like the word, uh, and I think Anthony mentioned about uh, being, uh, uh, you know, 
kind of like resisting and uh, undermining the narrative of our human humanity or culture. And I think we're all connected in that way. We're trying to uh, uh, instill. And I think this is where the comic book and the film, and we need more efforts like this, that the, the, that violence is uh, possible. Uh, and that is a solution. And so this is uh, for, for us, for our work is to help people uh, heal, to transform the war and the violence that they do to themselves by the way they live and so on. So when they are not reconciled inside, it's actually they can resort to that and, and, can, uh, and support that and condone that. And this is a, a very important uh, thing that we need to do at, at a very individual level. And then culturally, group-wise, nation, and so on, uh, to change uh, how we view violence as a solution. That's like, uh, you know, we need to help humanity grow out of the adolescent phase, you know. <laughs> so Sometimes I see it like that. You know, you hit me, I hit you back. <laughs> and so this is uh, very, very beautiful that there's a comic book, a film out now. And, the co and I still refer back to the, the comic book of Martin Luther King. as a, 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 And I think we need to do more of this. I mean, the military in America is doing that with all the you know, these advertisements that, you know, that that try to reach young people at their most vulnerable. They, they are like, you know, uh, sad. They don't have meaning. So these commercials for military is actually honing that. So we need a, an equal effort towards peace, towards uh, humanity, towards the love of life. So our work in our monastery and our retreats and so is to help people touch love with, for themselves, for their loved ones, and to love life. And they would never condone taking any lives for whatever reason, whether it's for protection of your nation, protection of your group, or even as an ex expression of your frustration and anger towards something, which is young people, are, you know, it's not just about the gun, but it's also about the mind and the heart of our culture that we actually allow that and so for me that's our work uh, is to help young people love life and they will never think about take picking up a gun let alone you know say a word that is uh, killing life uh killing other people's life force discrimination and so on so this is uh where i see the 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 comic book the film and we we, we could do much more effort especially you know i see anthony working with four and we should see you know like we're like the 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 counterpart uh, how do you say i don't want to say anti but we're like we need to have an equal kind of advertising campaign you know i i'm working with people in the university to offer a course on human how to be a human being with the aim of actually eventually having a table across the military on career day, you know, career day for young people to get jobs and stuff. The military is really prominent. So I would love to have a table right across from them for the monastery, the institution, uh, the academy of peace, and to, to show young people that there's other ways rather than uh, just going to train and that violence is okay. So this is uh, kind of like our our work, our, uh, you know, and to continue our teacher. And that's his whole life's work uh, to help bring peace, to help us touch the wonders of life. And we can, you know, continue that. And thank you, everyone, for, uh, you know, for gathering this, uh, this occasion. Thank you so much, Brother Young. Um, uh, Gregory and Anthony, you know, I know that this has been a journey uh, going on almost a decade now. Um, and, you know, along the way, I, I've been, and certainly we've had uh, in the United States a change in political administrations from when you started to where you are now and then and, and back again in some respects. Um, you know, war continues to be something, as Laura indicated, that is is a reality that um, has existed in the lifetimes of just about everyone who's still alive. It seems like there has never been a period without war. And then certainly over the last two plus years, the world has been navigating the 
the challenges both mentally, physically, and spiritually of a global pandemic as well. Um, what, why is this film so important now? You know, I know that um, this in some respects is a, is a reimagining or re-release of an earlier version of the film, but why is its release so important at this moment in our collective history? And Gregory, why don't we start with you? Uh, thank you, um, everyone, for you know, all of the uh, panelists and also all of the attendees. I'm so grateful um, for all of you um, and for Brother Papun for um, sharing these insights and also um, uh, being one of the continuations of Thai, um, for sure. <laughs> Um, but how I think the um, one of the reasons I think the film is um, very important for today and even in the future is because the film deals with issues that, you know, even though it seems like a long time ago in human history, uh, it's like the blink of an eye. I mean, uh, 50 years ago um, in human, the development of humanity is not a long time ago. And as Brother um, Tai Pap Yoon said, um, and it's something that I've also um, said during many discussions, I, it seems like humanity that we're, we're children, we're still infants, still learning how to walk and how to deal with each other in the playground. And um, although that's um, and, and, and on one hand insulting children who are definitely or generally more, um, more or wiser than, than many adults can be. Um, but the issues that were de dealt, that we're dealing with in the film, um, as it relates to the way that um, people from different cultures are working together, um, people from different uh, races, colors, religions, um, or non or non religion, um, came together to work um, towards the effort of peace um, and um, to do it in a nonviolent way and to use um, methods that were brought on from previous generations even and, uh, and from other cultures, Gandhi, um, you know, the Fellowship of Reconciliation and James Lawson and others who used the comic book and um, in their trainings for the Tennessee Lunch Counter sit-in um, uh, is one of the fascinating things about how this medium of comics can um, still be transported and utilized today. Um, uh, one of the things that is really powerful that I didn't know about until I worked on the film is how um, Alfred and Ty um, started this initiative and Sister Chen Kong started this initiative on the environment back in the 70s. I mean, it actually began before that, reading the letters. Um, Alfred started writing about this, but um, they were really progressive and pushing things um, uh, in the 70s connected to environmental issues. So, um, yeah, the work that they were doing um, and the messages that they imparted um, are as relevant or more relevant today um, as they were then. And I think that we can learn, um, and I'm still learning lessons from them um, while going over this film and rereading it. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it still is having an impact on me. And, um, and I, yeah, and I'm uh, very happy, um, although very exhausted, <laughs> very happy that I had uh, the opportunity to, um, yeah, to, to continue this story. And uh, Anthony, th uh, Gregory, thank you so much for sharing that additional insight and perspective. And Anthony, while um, uh, throughout the course of your involvement with this film, you've obviously more recently um, taken on this esteemed uh, sort of interim role as the co-executive director of FOR. Talk a little bit about why that organization is so important. And obviously, Alfred Hassler was such a seminal part of it. Um, talk about the work that you continue to do and how the film can become a, an important and valuable teaching tool for those efforts. Thank you again, Noam. So I would like to begin my response by inviting the singing bowl.
while spending time with Thai, Thich Nhat Hanh, Thai meaning teacher for those who don't know, uh, in Plum Village during the creation of the film, I was reminded that when we invite, as you heard in the film, the, the bell, it is the voice of our ancestors calling us home to our deepest truth in the present moment. It is an invitation to awaken from our illusion of separateness, and Thai continued to invite that. The Fellowship of Reconciliation in this moment is working collaboratively with others to invite that awakening from our illusion of separateness. When some of us are suffering, all of us are suffering, and we all are suffering. So this film tells a story, and FOR participates in trying to build friendship across cultures, faith, traditions, geographies. It tells a critically important story in this moment of pandemic, polarization, increased disparities between wealthy and poor, environmental crises. It tells a story of, of, of friendship and compassion and interconnection and interbeing. The comic itself <clears throat> has been translated as the film shares into multiple languages. Even as an educator, I had not been aware that those in, in Arab Spring at that time, as you saw in the film, were using the comic. The comic continues to be used in this day. And I saw a question about how might it be used in the, the Ukraine, for example. Um, we certainly at FOR are collaborating with uh, some folks in Russia who are speaking out against the war and are suffering consequences for that. And we're inviting them, you know, uh, hopefully helping connect them uh, with resources that help keep them safe in this moment. Uh, but the comic, uh, as it might be used in the Ukraine or anywhere else, is up to the people of that place to use it uh, as they see fit, right? To creatively confront violence and again, plant seeds of peace in the mud of war. We hope that it is a resource. I would just uh, add that, uh, of course, our comic, Five Powers Revolution, has been inspired by the MLK and the Montgomery Story comic, and that uh, comic was picked up by a young John Lewis when he was a boy. And he had never uh, never may have heard of the civil rights movement or Dr. Martin Luther King had he not picked up that comic book that was created by Alfred Hessler and Dr. King. And the rest literally is history. And so we don't know always the influence that something like a comic book can have. Uh, and it can be profound and transformative. And so we, with you all, and uh, hopefully joining with friends uh, committed to peace and nonviolence, justice across the world are hoping to do our part to share this story uh, as broadly as possible a story again of planting seeds of peace in the mud of war uh i hope that's helpful in some ways it's a it's been a obviously a painful and challenging time for all of us in so many ways and so none of us can do this work of peace and justice alone uh, we do so uh together building beloved community remembering we have to awaken from our illusion of separateness thank you so much for um that very thoughtful perspective and and a reflection on the important work that uh you the organization are doing and certainly that the film uh can reach that broad audience that may not necessarily be aware of all of these issues as well. Um, I want to thank our attendees who are, are already beginning to post some questions in the chat. I certainly invite anyone who does have a question for any of our panelists to do the same. Um, while we're at it, um, Chen has posted a question that I will pose to the panel now and invite anyone who would like to respond to do so. Um, and that question reads as follows. After the war ended in Vietnam, people still suffer a lot under the communist government and some of them tried to escape the country at the risk of their lives uh, it makes me feel like the end of the war was not enough to end the suffering i wonder if you have insights on how one really ends the suffering of people 
Uh, and let me open that up to anyone. Uh, Laura, why don't uh, you share your thoughts on uh, response to that question? Thank you. And it's obviously not an easy question. Um, I think that what is behind it, well, I think of two things. One thing I think of is that the Buddhist movement in that period was very much looking for a middle way, as I referred to before, they called it the third way, because they didn't believe that either of the militarily uh, armed forces at the time uh, would be providing the a peaceful and safe future for the entire uh, population of Vietnam. And I think that we've seen that played out over and over again um, in conflicts where uh, only military solutions uh, end up being the dominant ones. Um, I also think that what's important, you know, the, the, the question talks about the suffering that continues years after wars. And um, that's not only because of repression, it's also because of the weapons that are used that continue to impact people's lives. It's because of the destruction that's happened, of course. And I think that it's also very important in any kind of conflict situation to understand that uh, a war doesn't end when the guns stop. The, the destruction is still there. It's not only in the land and, and the air and sometimes the food and the, um, the, the bombed out villages. And so it's also just inside people. And, uh, and you often see this, this cycle of, of um, conflicts coming back because it never, it, it wasn't solved at any kind of human level. Or, and I think that for my work, I, I work with, with music around the world in conflict and post-conflict regions. And in some places we're working in places where the official war ended 20 years ago or longer. Um, and yet the culture of violence is still there. And the culture of suspicion is still there and the lack of safety and the ways that people become identified only by one label, for example, and, and can't really explore their own complex own identity. And I think that, that one of the things that peace workers need to be attentive of is, is those very human needs and that, that, um, working together and they're, and they're not, those aren't exclusively, um, of course, in war zones, as, as, um, as our brother just mentioned, the, the, the culture of violence is everywhere. And, and so I think it's, it's complex, like I said, I think if you're thinking about places where actual fighting shooting war has happened, that these are long, long term processes of healing and of of creating spaces where people can rediscover who they are, rediscover community, feel safe, feel uh, a, a sense of trust. And I think also, if I can also just touch back on your question earlier about some of the things that the film can do to contribute to this. Um, one is, as I think uh, maybe everybody's mentioned, just this storytelling, because people need stories. We need we need stories. We need we need examples. We need um, things to to inspire us. And I think that to me, I mean, I was part of the process of of not I'm not the filmmaker at all, but I was involved in it. So, but I find the film looking at it, it's it's beautiful. There's a lot of beauty in there. And I think that people also need beauty in our lives. We need real and genuine beauty, which inspires. And the other thing I think about the film, which also is connected to that idea of the ongoing long process, are just these stories of, for one thing, intersectionality, how these issues are connected worldwide. The, the, the idea that, what, 50 years ago that Ty and Alfred and, and, and Sister Shana Kong were talking about the environment as peace activists when it wasn't on anybody's agenda to connect those things, but also the idea of not knowing what the results will be of your action and doing it anyway. And with the trust that there will be results and that those results, even if they're not the ones that you're intending, will be good. And that means also that 
the means that you choose have to be connected to the ends that you want because you can't you can't take shortcuts in that you have to live that those principles in everything that you do and in in the way that you work so okay a little bit of a meandering answer but no, i think that's I, 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 my thoughts thank you lauren I, and i i think it definitely resonates as you said it's not a it's not an easy or straightforward response to a complex issue um uh, bro uh, Brother Fap Jung, um, I'm wondering, you know, I was really struck by your point, even about how, you know, the modern military, particularly in the United States, uses advertising and propaganda to really sell a particular narrative. Uh, they're in video games, they're fetishized in popular media and things of that nature. Um, but it does feel, you know, we hear these awful stories of you know, shooters and, and people who are navigating so much horrible trauma in their own rights that instead of finding an effective way of channeling it, they're, they're inflicting horrendous and horrific harm on others. Um, and it makes you think about the fact that uh, in the pandemic, I believe only accelerated this in some respects. So people are dealing with a lot of unresolved trauma. You know, I always like to say that everybody would benefit from seeing a therapist. Um, but what is your broader perspective on the idea that the end of war is not the end of suffering? So how do we navigate people dealing with ancestral trauma and unresolved trauma? Because that does seem to be something that perhaps people have a greater awareness of now, but yet we're still struggling. And what are the thoughts that um, Thich Nhat Hanh, Sister Cheng Kong, and then the work that you are doing help us get some clarity on that? I know that was a bit of a long question, but uh, hopefully that made sense. Mm, thank you. Uh, mm, thank you, Laura, for sharing. And it's beautiful, uh, you know, like the Buddhist teaching is like nothing ever, no, nothing ever ends is only continuation. So in the same way that war doesn't end, you know, I'm a product of the Vietnam, the war in Vietnam in my country and our family had to escape by boat. And so I lived through that the war didn't end in 1975 in terms of my family and my, what it did to my father and my mother. And I still have that in me. And so I'm very conscious that, you know, there are certain things still moving in me from a generation and many generations. And this is happening now with other countries. And so in the same way that uh, Laura shared that the war doesn't end and it continues, the war doesn't begin either by a country declaring war and bringing military and machinery to another, uh, you know, part of the world. But actually, the war is happening within society, within each person, by the way we promote and we, 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 we kind of say it's okay to have violence in our movies, in our messaging, and, and so on. I, I mean, it's everywhere that it's okay. For Sometimes violence is okay. Sometimes war is okay. We need to change that in education. And I think that's why I appreciate Gregory's work and, uh, you know, everyone involved in that is that we, we need to really, that's why we have working, uh, 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 you know, wake up schools movement in our tradition to actually reframe uh, uh, um, education, especially particularly about uh, violence and war and discrimination and hate, even in thought. So it's not just uh, that action you know, when it manifests that that's the beginning of war, but actually in our views, in our culture, that we say it's okay sometime, that actually is one of the reasons why young people are numb, that actually taking another life is like, you know, they're numb to that, that, that it doesn't, they cannot feel that. So this is something very, very uh, uh, important. And you have to look at how military is, is, is part of that and the way they promote movies they actually fund certain movies that have certain messages you know i watch some of these movies to know how they are working and so one yeah. just came out this past week top gun so yes 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 yeah, this is very and you know you know you, you look at some of the uh, <laughs> the military is funding those things 
anyway, I mean, I, I, you know, again, you know, I'm pretty radical in terms of like, you know, uh, subserv- uh, being uh, <laughs> subverting a lot of these things. And education is huge uh, in terms of young people because that's where they're most vulnerable right now. So in terms of violence, uh, uh, hate, and discrimination, we also have uh, also teach people wonder, to love life, to to enjoy nature, to uh, appreciate the food on their plate. So again, bringing wonder and then bringing meaning as well. This is what young people are lacking. You know, our culture of nine to five working at a job that is like you don't know what does this have anything to do with like. You know, so there's the meaning as well. And so, and, and wonder. So besides like uh, counteracting violence, hate, discrimination, war, we also like, uh, I think I imagine in the music uh, world, this is to love life, you know, to, 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 and then that right there, you, you, you have begin to have reverence to the universe, to like the unfolding of, you appreciate ants, you appreciate plants. You would never take a stick and hit a bush. This is what we're teaching young people. Say, so why would you do that to a bush? Come here, hug the bush. And this is what we do with the young uh, children's program in our monastery. And it's like, why are we, uh, 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 you know, stepping on ants? Can we get to our knees and look at ants? And when they understand that, wow, these ants, look what they're doing. And they understand the ants. And then there's a value, a respect, a reverence, even to the ants. And so now when we do walking, they're like trying not to step on ants. And that has everything to do with violence and the beginning of war. You know, it, it's, it's very uh, related, you know, and so this is our work. And I think we, we need to really uh, get everyone inspired with this to bring meaning to young people and to have them, you know, have a little awe and wonder and little magic back into the world rather than consuming and going to get these messages is kind of like, I, for me, propaganda in the highest sense uh, of to support capitalism and the militarization of our, 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 our planet, I think. And the environment is suffering because of that. So it's not just humans to humans, but it's the humans to how we view the planet as something that we can exploit. And anyway, this is, I don't want to like, you know, I can go on with this, <laughs> but this sure, is our no, life. Our life's work, you know. <laughs> I, th- I think what resonates to your point is that, you know, people tend to think about this as sort of um, a, a binary, the idea that, like, you address a problem uh, and try to identify a solution after the thing has happened, as opposed to recognizing that the work begins before the thing happened, that it doesn't, that we have a lot of work to do communally. Um, to recognize that we begin imparting those messages when people are are children, um, and and I think that there's a real responsibility, if you will, to reframe how we're approaching conflict and how we're approaching communication and how we're approaching accountability. Um, it's actually interesting since you bring up the work that uh, you do with young people, um, Gregory. I know that. Uh, in addition to this piece that you and the team also worked on a separate project that we'll make sure that the attendees today are aware of and know how to find, which is uh, an animated film called Planting Seeds of Mindfulness, and that that is specifically geared towards you know, that younger audience, the folks who are watching PBS, uh, you know, Sesame Street and Electric Company and things like that. Um, uh, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that project and its relationship to the five powers as well. And thank you very much, um, Brother Tatap Yum, for that insight. Um, yeah, that is um, spot on, as they say in the UK. Um, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned planting seeds of mindfulness because while working on this film, um, in the re-release of the five powers, I was thinking about planting seeds of mindfulness, which we've never actually officially released. Um, Although we were invited to film festivals and then presented there and, yeah, we were 
held over at, uh, yeah, at Illuminate Film Festival, I remember, because the audience really loved it. Um, but then uh, things happened with Ty getting, you know, um, Ty's illness and, and uh, yeah, a lot of things uh, as it related to a lot of projects, you know, had to understandably be, you know, take a step back. Um, but I was really thinking about that film, about how um, really relevant um, it always was, but um, how uh, I would, yeah, like to actually release that film officially um, because it tells the story. Um, it, it actually um, is based on Ty's best-selling book, um, Planting Seeds of Mindfulness for Children and, and Adults and Families, and um, where there are lessons uh that um, are contained and stories contained within um, this book that we uh, uh, worked with a writer, yeah, Gail Silverman, um, in order to um, bring that, uh, that um, teaching manual and, and book um, into life and to, um, yeah, and to uh, make it visually beautiful. Um, it's a very, uh, I think it's a very accessible way for um, uh, children, for parents um, who are dealing with conflict, children who are dealing with conflict with their parents um, between each other um, in school. Um, and um, the film deals with, you know, a lot of situations that, uh, that uh, children and adults deal with um, every day and have been dealing with um you know for some time um we it's also really beautiful because uh, tina turner donated her time um to uh, you know pro provide the soundtrack uh, um with the beyond foundation's uh, backing um and so the music that accompanies the film is just really powerful um the illustration and um, and the story um and um uh, and it imparts a lot of lessons um, uh, that um, are, um, you know, very important for children and adults and for today and also into the future. Excellent. Well, and then I know that uh, in the in the chat that uh, folks who are interested in uh, screening the five powers as a part of an organizational effort uh, have the contact info for Anthony and Bill has provided that and certainly um, uh, for this other project as well if anyone is interested in learning more. Yeah, I mean for the five powers they should actually contact me. Um, oh, gotcha, I'm, gotcha. Yeah, so Gregor, if you would be, I'm sorry, uh, if you would be so kind as to just put a um, put your email address or contact info in the chat so folks know how to get a hold of you that would be great thank you so yeah, much so can, okay yeah the five powers yeah i'll put that okay thank yeah, you but um, i'm the one that's handling the licensing and uh gotcha. yeah all of that stuff so no no may just no yes sir may, may just uh, add something about, about your question that I, I think is important to also mention because you talked about and laura talked about the continuation of suffering and how that's mm. passed on and it's very related to the mindfulness practice. And so this is what we teach people how to handle suffering. So it's not to eliminate suffering, but to use suffering. So from because a lot of our culture, we don't know how to deal with it. And that's exactly why it perpetuates. And this is what I feel that the Buddhism and uh, Thai and, you know, everyone like to acknowledge and to hold suffering to understand it and only through that so it's nothing negative about suffering the fact it's because we don't want to deal with it that's why it perpetuates and this is very important uh, and that's why mindfulness practice meditation looking into the cause of suffering why it happened and understanding it and only then can you actually have a chance to actually not you know, habitually continue and 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 think that, that same way, and it's the running away from suffering in our culture, and that's why it perpetuates. As you can see with the violent shooting and all that, it's the source of it is that people don't know how to deal with their suffering, their resentment, their hate, and so they lash out. So we teach young people that suffering is okay, sadness is okay, depression is okay, but there's other things. 
And then from nourishing themselves, they can see the, the cause of their suffering, their self-judgment, their self-hate, so on. And then their resentment towards their parents. We teach them how to resolve that. Look at their father. Like, do you remember when they were young? What went? What happened to your father? So in that reconciliation with their parents, with themselves, then they can be liberated. They, they have more access to energy, to life force. You know, people who hold resentment usually will lash out at others. So suffering has a role to play. I just wanted to mention that it's important. It's not uh, to be get rid of. You cannot get rid of suffering. It's actually how we can hold it, understand it, and use it as an energy, as a force. Our teacher's last statements in his uh, teaching life is that we need to teach people how to suffer. Can you imagine that? I was like, what? What do you mean? Yeah, we need to teach people how to suffer. They need to learn how to suffer, and then they will suffer less. Isn't that amazing? There's no te- people out there teaching that. And then why would you teach people how to suffer? That's exactly what we need to do to bring into school. We need, you know, everyone's learning how to succeed, how to uh, get uh, uh, acknowledgement, how to, you know, all this success. But actually, we need to teach young people how to suffer. And that sounds really weird, but actually, it's exactly no, what I we think do. It makes sense. Yeah. Sorry. I, uh, no, no, nothing to apologize wanted to for. to add that was important, our view on suffering. Yeah. Thank you for that Thank perspective. You. Um, you know, since a, such a big part of the film is obviously about uh, the practice of mindfulness in those five powers, I'd love for each of our panelists to uh, share a little bit about how the practice of mindfulness has enriched your life. Um, I know it's it's uh, as much about the journey, m- even maybe more so than the destination, but uh, I'd love to just get any insights on how that work has benefited each of you collectively and individually. So, uh, Anthony, why don't we start with you, sir? Thank you again. I'm just also going to share in the chat uh, briefly uh, that we have created a study guide. One of the things we're doing at the Fellowship Reconciliation is trying to invite conversations and connection, provide resources and networking and working with our chapters and religious peace fellowships to share uh, opportunities for this kind of a gathering and this kind of a dialogue and a conversation. So we created a study guide that's available for free that accompanies the MLK and the Montgomery Story comic. And we also created a short study guide for the Five Powers Revolution film. And we're going to be continuing to develop that. And the links are in the chat. In terms of mindfulness practice, I I grew up um, playing sports as an athlete. And there's a book called The Mindful Athlete that I highly recommend by George Mumford. Uh, George Mumford suffered from addiction and himself was a professional basketball player. Uh, George Mumford was known for um, actually ultimately saying that mindfulness saved his life in prison and having gone through uh, a lot of suffering. Uh, and then he went on to teach it to young people. He commit he has committed his life to teaching mindfulness practice to young people, especially in urban areas, people of color in the United States. He also, though, taught uh, th- these classes to uh, a guy named Phil Jackson, who some may know as the the coach of the Lakers and the Bulls during their championship runs. And they used to practice mindfulness in the locker room before their games. And I, I don't, you know, I, I think mindfulness can be appropriated. It can, you know, there is a real discipline and practice to it. And, and yet um, it can be utilized by artists and athletes and young people. And I know in my own experience, it has helped me tremendously to simply be here now without judgment. When I was in the presence of Thai and was in, I had the privilege also of working, living with Mother Teresa in Calcutta the summer before she passed, when in presence of my grandmother, my Italian grandmother, one thing that struck me was that they were fully present with me. I was all that mattered when I was with them. And that presence doesn't just happen. That takes practice and discipline, right? Faithfulness, uh, diligence, concentration, mindfulness, concentration. And then the insight. And so it's a practice of presence. It's a practice of self-care. And so I I invited the singing bowl earlier in every class that I teach. I'm an educator and a social worker. And oftentimes, um, 
I will use the singing bowl just to center myself and also with my students or with communities to invite a simple practice of presence, to be present to your own deepest truth and desire so that you can be more present to others, especially those who are suffering. And it is a practice, yes, of self-care. Uh, and that self-care is, in my opinion, the work of social justice. We cannot do the work of justice if we don't take care of ourselves. So mindfulness practice has been central uh, to me, in, and it is a daily practice, right? So it's ongoing. Um, and yet it's not something that one should, oh, I can't do that, or I'll never be able to. No, it's uh, be here now without judgment. It's not about doing it right or wrong. It's about taking that time for yourself to connect again to your deepest desires and truth to practice presence so that you can be, even in most difficult and painful situations, uh, hopefully a little more centered, a little bit more compassionate uh, and do that work of peace and justice. The world needs us. The world needs you uh, to do that work. Um, and so mindfulness has been central to my attempt to do that in the world. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much as well. Um, Laura, I'll pose the same question to you. How has the practice of mindfulness within your own life helped enhance the work you do and, and deepened your understanding of yourself and the world in which you live? Well, I guess I'm thinking about that period of my life when I was living in that community and the ways in which I learned. I didn't learn by going to a retreat or, or you know, being within a, a monastic community, but more by the very presence that Anthony was also just talking about and the openness to the entire reality. And I think that everybody's alluded to being there for the other. And it's something that Ty said at some point, probably many points, is the best thing that you can give to another person is your total presence. The, the most precious thing you can give. And I think that when I, I'm not I'm not sure how to answer the question exactly, but something about that, about that to me, the the my own mindfulness I feel most keenly when I'm with someone else and connecting to that person in by listening, by supporting. And maybe that has to do with being a kind of elder in some sense, of being in that role now and and working with many people most of whom are younger than i and with my children with my grandchildren the idea of of holding community and being present in that community is i think for me sort of the, that's where i am now with with that experience and and the what i learned from um being part of that community so many years ago and then revisiting it. So it's a kind of a different story, but I, that's the way it makes me feel. Also that when you're with people who are um, either in conflict or in their own difficult situations, again, that just being there, being there and, 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 and listening and holding, and I guess that's also the non-judgment, but um, being supportive because I think that this this is one of the things that is most missing in our culture is connection. So it's not just taking care of yourself. I don't think that self-care makes sense without there being other care connected to that. Mm. And to me, that's that's also what our work is is about in Musicians Without Borders. I say it in a funny way, but that, that all these threads of, of nonviolence and and um having learned from such an amazing master at that time in a very different phase and also just the music and connecting that is but there's something about the interconnection and the empathy that comes from that and that only starts in yourself when you've got that um that groundedness i think Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that answer as well. Um, we've reached the one hour mark, so I'd like to um, 
maybe uh, wrap up uh, with some final thoughts from everyone on the panel. Um, and uh, Gregory, I know you just raised your hand, uh, so please chime in as well. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, mention that I set it up for an hour and a half, just in case uh, we went over when All I right. set it up. Um, so, we, so we have a little bit of a tiny bit of time. Um, yeah, I wanted to touch on the, the, yeah, the question that you asked about mindfulness and also um, uh, Tai Fat Yun um, was uh, mentioning about learning suffering and how, you know, and how that's dealt with because, um, yeah, it's something, uh, part of my daily meditation is to, um, to transform my the suffering and the trauma and the pain um, that I have experienced personally, but also I realize that there is also intergenerational suffering that comes from, um, and, that, and that Sister Chen Kong and Tai have spoke about in terms of our ancestry and how we have to be aware that you know maybe all of the things that are going on inside of us. Yeah, of course, they're inside of us, but they also can come from other places, whether that's our ancestry or from, you know, uh, from within or without. And so part of my meditation is to transform um, the suffering, the pain, the suffering um, and the trauma that I am, that I've experienced and that I may be feeling, um, but to also um, transform the pain and suffering and trauma that I have caused consciously or unconsciously um, onto someone else um, and to transform those things into compost um, to, for the, for, to build a better and more um, uh, constructive future um, where, we can, where I can heal my own suffering but also help to transform and heal um, any suffering that I've caused on someone else because we, we play um, um, all, yeah, we play both of these roles, um, uh, multiple roles um, in our lives. So I, I wanted to share that and, um, because that's one of the really important lessons that I learned. I mean, many important lessons, but that it's okay to, to feel suffering um, and to feel these things because as a multiracial American, yeah, six cultures and yeah, two parts Native American, African and um, French, Mexican, <laughs> uh, and Irish. Um, you know, a lot of times we're raised that, um, and especially as a, you know, in the, in the black community and in the Latino community, that's, you don't, and I even know my, some Vietnamese friends, you don't talk about suffering. Yeah. You don't talk about it with your family. You don't talk about it with your friends. You know, you, you, you know, keep your mouth shut and you just, you know, you deal with it. Um, and, um, and I think that, uh, that, that all actually causes us to suffer more. So, um, to, yeah, one of the greatest lessons that I've learned working with this, with working with the Thich Nhat Hanh community and working with Thai and Sister Chen Kong and, and the brothers and sisters and lay people, and family, you know, strangers from across the world is that it's okay for us to know that we're suffering, to feel our suffering, and to also share it with others. And um, uh, whether it's one other person or whether, you know, we're, we're in, uh, you know, at a retreat. That, um, that, and, when we, and, and when we do have these moments of sharing, we find out that we're not alone, that we're, you know, that there's other people who are feeling the same, similar things than we are, no matter where they come from. And, um, and this is a, this has been and is continuing to be, uh, you know, a source of, of, uh, of, of joy for me and it's continuing on, um, and, and just thinking of Laura talking about interconnection, I'm going to end here, um, uh, how, you know, because of this new re-release of this project. Um, I was contacted by someone who's working in nonviolence and environment and also um, in mindfulness from Finland, um, Timo, um, who um, has translated the, the movie into um, Finnish. And um, because there are difficult conversations going on in Finland, 
you know, um, uh, um, uh, a new connection has been made with uh, a, a, you know, a, pra a practitioner and a community that I had no idea existed um, before I started working and we started working on this new release of the film. So thank you for uh, listening. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much um, for that additional perspective and insight as well. Um, um, and uh, let me just close and, and also pose the question, which I think he's largely already answered, uh, uh, Brother Fap Jung, which is, um, you know, you've made mindfulness obviously a, a central part of, of your life's work. Um, how has it continued to enrich you and what insights has it brought to your own journey and perspective uh, that you can share with our group today? Yeah, thank you for uh, allowing me to share again. I just want to, you know, uh, and reframe a little bit. You know, I, I'm a Buddhist monk, but actually, you know, in the time of the Buddha, there was no Buddhism. So I always consider myself a, a resistor, a, a rebel, a, um, you know, a, sub a subversion. <laughs> and this is uh, as we remove less, we shave our hair and we just have one style of clothing and live in solitude within community. We uh, can touch a lot of fullness about life so we are not running nine to five to make uh, uh, false securities for ourselves so this is a kind of my resistance to the culture so our teachers called us uh, the community of resistance and i always remind myself that, that what are we resisting we're resisting the narrative of our times our culture what is uh you know what is success what is uh, uh you know what is the purpose of life uh so this is you know for me uh, i just wanted to reframe that so that people know that this is not a religious thing this is a human thing the evolution of human consciousness you know brought us to this level we're not just you know animal reacting and 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 fearful and but there's love there's compassion and there's these other elements that are what in many spirit tradition you know call god call the ultimate call the divine and so on and this is for me my my dedication i changed career from being an architect to being one of uh, an explorer uh, a, a curious animal uh, about what it means to be the two-legged uh, species, <laughs> you know, not just to run after bananas and jump from tree to tree, but to 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 love uh, and wonder, you know. And this is for me what we are teaching young people that is so beautiful to be alive, and you are gonna live for eighty, ninety years if you're lucky. Uh, in this way, in this, you have this mind, and please, you know, God, savor it. And so this is, and we, we, and then there's steps to it, you know, in the, in our tradition, the, the, it, the mind training has been uh, made into a technology by the Indian ancestor, all our teachers, you know, they, they honed it. We fold our legs to sit still. Why do we do that? Because it's a message that we are enough. We don't need to run. In fact, the, the teen retreat we're coming up to have in a week and a half, the title of the retreat is Enough, Enough, You Are Enough. That's the title of the retreat. And we're going to be teaching teenagers to, it's okay not to run around. It's okay not to have friends. You are enough. And from that fullness of acceptance of, you know, happy with yourself and being a real true friend to yourself, then you can offer a lot to other people. So you're not running after friendship, but friendship will come. So this is what we, the message we want to teach. And this is the resistance, all the messaging in, you know, society, in Twitter, in, in the social media is that you are not enough in the marketing, you know, they undermine our youth. And so it's not just about violence, it's about happiness. And so we teach people, to resist the message 
So I don't know if that answers anything, but I just want to reframe. People might be wondering, what what is the monk doing here? You know, <laughs> but this is our teacher, and this is what he helped me with to save my life. And 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 you know, and I feel like I w- I want to dedicate that to many many teachers who have given me so much. And I just want to pass that on to young people and to just people in general. Yeah. Thank you, Excellent. everyone. For and and you know, I think um, so much of what we're exposed to in our modern culture is about certain narratives, politically, socially, culturally. So I'm a big advocate for constantly reframing the narrative and challenging our own assumptions in that regard as well. Um, uh, and we've had some lovely sentiments expressed in the chat as well. So once again, thank you for all the attendees who have stuck around with us this morning to watch the film and subsequently to uh, listen to this very lively and illuminating discussion. Um, uh, I would like to just get sort of final thoughts from each of our panelists on um, uh, the film, your hopes for it, um, and how people who are inspired by it can continue to be involved with the work of, uh, you know, all of the organizations that are reflected therein, uh, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, the Thich Nhat Hanh Foundation, the Five Powers Creators Fund, uh, which I know Gregory will speak a little bit about as well. Um, and uh, just parting thoughts for our audience today as we wind down this conversation. So, um, Gregory, uh, Actually, Anthony, why don't we begin with you? Sure. Thanks so much again. I can't thank uh, all of you enough, <clears throat> panelists and participants, for your support. And again, the beloved community that exists beyond those who could be with us in this moment here, who've supported the film and done the work of justice and peace in the world. I love, uh, <clears throat> Brother Pap Young, your notion of creating a community of resistance. And I love kind of co-opting and uh, adapting and adopting that for FOR, for the Fellowship of Reconciliation, creating a community of resistance to subvert the world order. Uh, And that's what we're trying to do. And we hope that this film is just a a drop of water that uh, contributes to the the waterfall, the flowing river uh, that changes the world. Um, Again, we need one another. We need each other. I'm inspired by uh, Ty's notion of interbeing, uh, this notion that uh, no mud, no lotus, maybe you've heard that, you know, we need the the dirt and the suffering is part of our, uh, again, as you so poetically shared, uh, Brother Bap Young, uh, Ty's teaching about suffering in his one of his final teachings, um, and that is part of who we are and how we suffer is so critically important. Fellowship of Reconciliation uh, helped initiate a lamenting into hope uh, initiative and is trying to provide resources and educational materials and convenings like this for folks who are looking to, again, create a community of resistance to subvert the world order. If you're interested, please reach out to me. Uh, Obviously, uh, if you're interested in viewing uh, or sharing the film, reach out to Greg or any of us. Um, but I'll maybe close by saying uh, one of the mantras that I like to use actually is, I think, picks up on this notion of our illusion of separateness from Thai and our interbeing. And it comes from Valerie Kaur, who's uh, a partner and friend and an ally and wrote a book called See No Stranger. And she has a simple practice where she, while walking down the street, uh, looks to the other and says, you are a part of me, I do not yet know. You are a part of me, I do not yet know. And that simple little practice has helped her. And I think I think of it also as a practice of connection and compassion um, and conf- confrontation of the powers that be in the world order that we need to subvert. Uh, so uh, the last recommendation I have is to read Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet by Thich Nhat Hanh, which I'm reading now and to continue the good work that you all are doing and to thank you again for your support and for being here today. Thank you so much, Anthony. Uh, Laura, let me hand it off to you. Any sort of final parting thoughts as we uh, conclude this very illuminating discussion today? 
Thank you. Well, yes, all of the above, and also um, art. I remember, I mean, Tai was a poet, an amazing poet. Uh, Sister Chan Kong, I remember in our younger years that she could sing the tears into your eyes, this beautiful Vietnamese lullabies and traditional songs, such an amazing voice. I think the film filmmaking is also an art. And art is what expresses our humanity. And Brother Fab Young talked about these horrible military films that the that that promote militarism. Why do they do that? Why why does the Pentagon pour money into that kind of thing? Because art communicates. And I think that um, those of us who are active in the arts have a role to play in communicating this subversive message. And I think we should all take that very seriously, also very joyfully. But to do that and to, to understand that the arts are the most powerful way to communicate the essence of being human and the connection and the potential for subverting, for resisting, but also for creating this joyful, different kind of community that we're all hoping to create. So that, you know, just let's keep that at the front, front and center, films, music, uh, graphic arts, painting, uh, tell those stories and, 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 and help people to imagine what it could be. You're muted. No, pardon me. I was saying thank you so much for that insight. And, and you know, I'm a big believer in the critical importance of the arts as a, as a tool to heal the world. Um, uh, Brother Fap Young, um, as well, uh, any final thoughts? You've shared so much great insight and perspective. And, uh, you know, as we uh, conclude today's discussion and additional folks have the opportunity to watch this and watch the film, I'd love to hear any thoughts you might have to share. Yeah, I just wanted to add that in the spirit of interbeing, we can also introduce the word uh, divert, uh, diversion. So to choose an alternative path, sometime in resistance and in subversion, we think that there's an enemy or there's something we need to go against. So for us, uh, we also keep aware that they are not our enemy. They are not against us. We are not against them, but actually we just offer different choices because right now polarization is like huge and radicalization is like, like, you know, like the virus, <laughs> everybody just like runs to their corner and, and, and then like tighten up. So we want to give space to allow that different viewpoint, but then, you know, allow people to choose to divert and to choose a different path, a different way of looking. So that's, it's important to us in, in that, in that we don't confront, but we uh, go, you know, kind of make the circle a little bigger. <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, people doing their work, everyone, you know, don't underestimate. And I think this film is an example of that from the very initial seed of the comic book with the civil rights movement through all of this to now this conversation. Do not underestimate your actions, even how, how level how lit it is, taking care of your garden, making sure you're happy, you're good with your neighbors. So whatever scope we're at, whether we're doing like world uh, uh, events and, you know, changing, you know, hunger and so on, don't underestimate goodness at whatever level that is. And that's what keeps the, the despair from, uh, you know, taking over that we at least hold our garden and we take care of our garden, meaning our mind, our neighborhood, our relationship, and that we're happy and that you, we, we will die not disgruntled is already a good cause. <laughs> That's a great contribution to world peace. You die and you're smiling, you know, you're like not angry at anybody. So please don't underestimate uh, the good energy wherever you are and this is as we spread that we can make a network of goodness of wholesomeness of good thoughts in the world and so this is one of you know to share that that we don't all have to be 
doing headline activities, but just taking care of ourselves, eating properly, you know, how we speak to others, our neighbors, people, strangers on the street, whatever we do, don't, that's what it means, resistant. Don't let the despair, the news that they we're hearing, you know, dictate our lives in the way we view the world. We need to resist that. Don't let the negativity and all the corruption and all that stuff take over you. We need to really go against that. That's what we're against, not people, not groups, but energies. So we need to practice to do that because I know sometimes it's hard. And that's why we need communities and good, like-minded friends. You know? Thank you for gathering this. I, I just feel so nourished. <laughs> Thank you so much. And it's such a privilege to be a part of this conversation in this community. And then, uh, Gregory, um, why don't we wrap up with you? Um, you know, this film was brought into the world through the incredible work and diligence that you have led with an amazing team of practitioners and, and creative filmmakers. Um, as you reflect on its release at this time in this moment, um, what is your hope for it? How are you using it as a tool to expand the discussion? And how can those who are inspired by what it represents learn more and become involved? Um, thank you for the question, Brother Gnome. Um, I wanted to start out by watering some seeds. And, and you know, the reality is, yeah, I was drawing a circle as uh, Laura and Tai Tai Yum and Anthony were talking. And as we're talking about interconnectedness, the reality is that if a professor didn't introduce me to a book uh, and FOR, I wouldn't have worked for FOR. I would have never met Laura Hassler. I wouldn't have known about the story of the MLK comic book because I learned it from her and, uh, and about her father from her in her home <laughs> in uh, Alkmaar, or, yeah, in the Netherlands. And then also learned about her work with Musicians Without Borders firsthand which is just amazing. Um, so this is something Laura's very, I mean, she's very good at uh, promoting uh, musicians, but she's also very humble. Um, and, uh, and I have uh, witnessed her work in the Netherlands, also in, um, and in the Middle East, um, when we spoke at Hebrew University and did some other work. And I, yeah, um, accompanied her on to visit some projects. Um, and and thinking also how Laura is a continuation of her mother and father and with her um, being around Sister Chen Kong and Thich Nhat Hanh and the work that she did there. That's, I was thinking, Laura, you've actually built a mindful community. Musicians Without Borders, from seeing um, how you work and the joy and the, the power that is um, within that organization. Yeah, I get goosebumps thinking about it. So I wanted to water those seeds and to pay honor to, um, to Laura and, of course, my professor and brother Tai Tai Yum and Noam, who we haven't even had a chance to talk about. So I wanted to mention that first. Um, and then, um, you know, Noam and I have been talking about, actually for a long time, um, uh, about, like, funds for creators. And Tai Tai Yum reminded me... Um, about the whole the funding of the military and how much money um, uh, we spend on uh, current military budgets, past military, even the repairing old equipment, and then um, there's so much money that's not even in the normal uh, you know the normal top line military budgets. It's it's a staggering amount of money um, that uh, should, in my opinion be dedicated more towards um, the citizenry and taking care of, make sure, making sure we have good health care and like fundamental things, um, fundamental human rights. But also we've taken a lot of money away from the arts. So you have a lot of creators who are competing all the time just to stay above water. And I've seen uh, the situation and then COVID came and I've seen a lot of my creator friends um, who are already having a, you know, a difficult time, um, just really, you know, really suffer. Um, so while we were, you know, when Anthony had talked about rebooting the project, and this was last 
May, I think. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I spoke about is that, um, you know, if I was going to do it again, I wanted to um, realize a dream that we had before, but we just could not realize. And that was to offer the comic book in multiple languages. Um, because there, there's a, you know, if it's only in English, um, then uh, when the rest of the world, um, you know, there's a, 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 you know, a lot of Spanish speakers, Portuguese, French, Italian, um, and, you know, I wanted to make it um, more accessible um, to have it um, because the story is important and should be, should be told and shared. So that was one of the, one of the things. And, um, and then the other thing is I've been, you know, been following and involved in some way, um, in the, um, NFT, um, arena and, um, and seeing how projects that, in my opinion, are not really about anything, um, are actually generating, um, large sums of money and, um, and so I never had the ambition or the, the, you know, the idea that we would make a whole lot of money because we're still in debt because of <laughs> last, <laughs> but that's how it is for creators. Um, but I did have the dream that we, you know, maybe we'll be fortunate and, um, and in the pursuit of creating these collector's edition comics and um, NFTs. Uh, digital and print um, so that we could raise the money to, yeah, for our prior supporters and team. Um, but uh, also as important is to have a fund for creators so that we could actually fund, help to fund projects that we believe in. Um, and, uh, and, and after we, you know, meet with people and find out what they're about, but, you know, projects like Musicians Without Borders deserve to be funded. There's projects like the Five Powers and its comics, um, initiatives that the Fellowship for Reconciliation is doing, the Wake Up Retreats that is doing creative work. Um, you know, there's, there are so, there are many things that um, don't require money, but um, there are things, you know, projects like these do. Um, and, um, and so that's, so my big my big, hairy, audacious goal <laughs> um, of, that I'm very not attached to, because that's the only way I can really do things <laughs> that I've learned, um, is to is for our multilingual comic books that um, are going to be available for the general public um, in the coming months. Um, the French one is finished. The French. Um, the French comic book is finished. The Portuguese, probably a couple of weeks away to get rechecked. And then, um, yeah, there's several other coming out. The NFTs and the collector's edition, I think we're talking about releasing those in uh, the end of June. Um, um, but there will be, um, we will be sharing um, that information with the Thich Nhat Hanh Foundation, um, uh, who has so graciously um, promoted this um, and, and to the community. Um, and, um, and to any others, and of course, FOR and to any others, um, that, um, you know, would be interested. Um, one last thing about the study guides, cause this is something that's, um, I think really, yeah, incredible, you know, also really incredible, important. The MLK study guide, yeah, is finished. Um, there's this two page study guide that we just started working on and, um, and um, or that the fellowship, one of their teams started working on. I was in communication today, and we're going to continue expanding on that um, uh, so that there is a study guide connected to the film. And I would love to actually have uh, more of these things, like more educational webinars, but um, where they're actually meetings so that we could have um, uh, participants in like online workshops where we can um, deal with these issues and bring them to the practice. And um, this is something I was, um, I was uh, uh, meditating on today, that I would actually like to, to do this and continue this. So if anyone is interested um, in um, any information about the release of the comic books, um, the release of the movie, 
um, yeah, um, then please uh, feel free to reach out to me, to contact me at this um, uh, the email address that I put online. Um, you can also check on the Five Powers website, uh, Five Powers Revolution website, because we will be continually updating that. Um, and then there's also um, a mailing list form um, that is on the website, um, and that I also put at the end of the film um, for anyone um, who had um, any further um, inquiries. You can also always contact Anthony about the movie. Um, you can contact me. I worked for 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 over 10 years and um, and I'm still very much interconnected <laughs> to um, to their work. And um, yeah, and I wanted to make sure I thanked everyone. Um, Bill McGarvey for going to thank you um, for um, being a co-host and also Noam Drummy who has not talked about himself um, because um, if it um, when we talk about the team, I mean, Noam is so Anthony, Noam, and myself, we're all three Geminis. So I always joke <laughs> that, uh, you know, the three Geminis brother, but Noam is actually, I think he maybe, yeah, I think he's the youngest, <laughs> but he's uh, actually the, um, the Thich Nhat Hanh for me. He's the one, uh, yeah, I consider him, yeah, my, yeah, my like greatest mentor with Anthony being my other mentor and me being, um, the, the, the student. <laughs> so Noam is, um, yeah, my advisor who, yeah, who I, I, I rarely will do anything, um, that I'm really contemplating without talking to him and saying, I need your opinion. So, I um, mean, he is doing incredible work for, um, reboot, working with reboot, and then all of the other film work that he's done, Emmys that he's been nominated for, Emmys that he's won. Um, he's very humble and brilliant, and uh, Anthony and I are very fortunate that uh, we have him as part of this um, project. Well, thank you for your kindness, and once again, thank you to this esteemed panel. Uh, thank you to uh, our attendees who have uh, joined us this uh, whatever part of the world you're in, morning, <laughs> afternoon, evening. And uh, we thank you so much for your time. For more information, as Gregory said, you can visit the five powers And uh, please follow us from there on social media. And we look forward to continuing this discussion and subsequent conversations. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you all. Appreciate you all. Wow. Fantastic. Oh.